Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome, welcome back to part two of uh, uh, my lecture on chapter six of um, interaction design fourth edition. And uh, here we begin uh, in about the middle of the chapter where we're talking about interaction design as it relates to um, interfaces that's the subject of chapter six and uh, for this it's interfaces for consumer electronics and appliances so uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about are everyday devices that we're going to use in a home in a public place or in a car they might be washing machines remote controls photocopiers printers gps's those kinds of things and personal devices, uh, MP3 players, uh, digital clocks, digital cameras. Um, I guess it could include a, it could include a smartwatch. Those kinds of things. There's used they're used for short periods, putting the washing on, watching a program, buying a ticket, changing the time, taking a snapshot. And they need to be usable, uh, ideally with minimal or uh, no learning, because people uh, people don't want to adopt things that have a high cost of starting. So, if you want to think of a pretty simple device that we might control with a digital interface, let's think about a toaster. And here we have a picture of one with the basic physical controls. Um, you know, we've got the slots to put the uh, the bagel halves in. And then we have the push down uh, control that allows us to uh, start the toasting. And it looks like we have a dial to choose how dark we want to do it. And maybe there's a button in the middle of that dial that allows us to pop it up early. I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to tell. So what are some of the research and design issues for uh, these kinds of things? Uh, well, there's a need to design these as transient interfaces with short interactions. Uh, OK, one of the things that happens with these uh, devices a lot is that they change mode as they move from state to state. Uh, and so we need to be able to kind of interact with them in, in their current state, and then we need to be able to move on to interact with them in their next state. Simple interfaces seem to work rather than complex ones. Of course, that's probably true of everything. Uh, and we need to consider the trade-off between soft and hard uh, controls uh, buttons or keys uh, versus uh, dials or scrolling. I know that I tend to prefer the the uh, buttons or keys. Uh, the dials and scrolling seem to be a little bit. Uh, well, you know, let's uh, go back to this. So. Uh, um, and there really are. Uh, more possibilities than this. I'm kind of thinking of my uh, smartwatch, which is probably part of another mobile category. But let's say it's one of these. My smartwatch, which I got over the holidays, has got uh, five buttons, OK? Three on the left side, two on the right. And I found this pretty daunting, OK? And they have labels, although they're a little bit hard to find. And um, as you engage the button, you do get a change in the state on the white on the watch face. So that kind of makes some soft buttons in a way, um, because they do change their functions depending upon where you are within the dialogue. Um, but one of the things that they're not is your typical kind of mapped soft buttons that we see on some interfaces where say there are four buttons and we keep changing the labels that are over the buttons and so you always uh, know which button or you have a pretty strong hint about which button to go to um, I found this pretty frustrating when I got it uh, my wife's very good at these kinds of interfaces though and uh, luckily she uh, 
she figured it out and read the book and showed me how to use it because I'm one of those people who only reads the manual in cases of electric shock. And with uh, a little tutoring from her, I've become pretty good at this one. Uh, mobile. Well, here we are. They'd throw this into mobile if, if not. They'd uh, throw my watch into mobile if not into, uh, into appliances. They're handheld devices intended to be used while on the move. They've become pervasive, increasingly used in all aspects of everyday and working life. Um, the apps that we have that run on the mobiles have greatly expanded, used in restaurants to take orders for car rentals, supermarkets for checking out, in the streets for multi-user gaming and education to support lifelong long learning. Um, a lot of transportation applications. I, I use one on my train that I take to Milwaukee. Um, uh, it keeps track of my electronic uh, ticket and how much is left, and it gives them uh, um, gives them a code to scan and all kinds of stuff. Um, the advent of the iPhone app uh, was a real big thing. And of course, uh, now we don't only have iPhone apps. We have uh, Android apps as well. Uh, it was a whole new user experience that was designed primarily for people to enjoy. And enjoy we have. Many apps are not designed for any need you want to uh, want or use, but poor, uh, purely for idle moments to have some fun. Well, I would say that that's a want. Uh, well, okay, so they're not designed for any need. They're designed for want. Um, there's a good uh, description in the text of, of this uh, iBeer application, which is kind of a nice uh, party trick. Not one that I've had, um, but apparently one that's uh, popular with the authors. Uh, and the ingenious use of the accelerometer that's inside the phone with iBeer, it's really made a lot of things go. So uh, there's just all kinds of games and applications that work better uh, when motion can be detected and when the orientation of the device can be detected. So here's our iBeer app. I'd much rather have the actual beer, I think. Uh, QR uh, codes are pretty cool stuff. Not only can you use a, a cell phone to scan a QR code, but in the case of transportation apps that I mentioned before, like the one that I use for Amtrak and the ones that I use for the airlines, um, you can display a QR code on your uh, a smartphone and their scanners can read it from your uh, a smartphone. So pretty, tic uh, pretty typically that's how they tell, um, uh, that's how they find your ticketing information. Uh, Mobile challenges, uh, smaller screens, a small number of physical keys, and a restricted number of controls. Well, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that, yeah, screens were initially smaller, but I, I for instance, have an iPhone Plus, and a lot of uh, my friends have uh, equally big uh, uh, Android phones, and really being small is not a problem anymore. Um, a small number of physical keys is uh, probably a good thing if you create enough um, uh, touchable controls. So the problem with the physical keys is you have to remember what they do. So my iPhone has, I guess, uh, three or two, depending upon how you count. Uh, or perhaps four, if you want to count very generously. Um, and I use them a whole lot less than I use um, the buttons on my smartphone because my, uh, I mean, my, my smartwatch, my, um, my smartwatch is a Garmin Phoenix 3 HR. 
and it has a uh, the watch face is uh, graphical but it's not touch uh, sensitive so the buttons are all physical whereas my iPhone 6 Plus uh, the physical buttons are few but most of the interaction is done with the touchable screen and uh, I think that's probably a good thing um, to the extent that we've had uh, things that are small to deal with well we've come up with all kinds of things like roller wheels rocker dials uh, lips on the face of phones two-way and four-way directional keypads uh, the fact is that the preference these days seems to go towards uh, uh, soft keys and icons because we have such great uh, touch screens uh, usability and preference varies it depends on the dexterity and commitment of the user although this uh, kind of general iPhone touch interface is really kind of taken over okay so there was a uh, there was a time when you might want something that works like the iPhone and the Android or or you might want something that uh, uh, works like a blackberry but that that ship has sailed uh, blackberry is either dead or all but dead uh, some research and design issues mobile interfaces can be tricky and cumbersome to use for those with poor manual dexterity or fat fingers the key concern is the hit area so the amount of area that's going to be sensitive um, to the touch uh, the space needs to be big enough for fat fingers like mine uh, if it's too small you might accidentally press the wrong key and I've gotten better with that over time but certainly I'm not as good as other people like uh, my wife or my adult uh, children who seem to have a much uh, better touch uh, than I do they've also got smaller fingers I think okay let's talk about speech applications so this is where a person talks with the systems that has a spoken language application something like a timetable or a travel planner um, it's used most for inquiring about very specific information like flight times or performing a transaction or uh, buying a ticket uh, it's also used by people with uh, disabilities because so um, uh, it, it might for instance be used uh, to recognize speech and turn it into text or text and turn it into uh, speech so we might have uh, speech recognition word processors page scanners web readers and home control systems um, have speech interfaces come of age I'd say they have I mean we have in the last say five years we've turned a corner where we have things like uh, oh uh, Siri on the iPhone and the equivalent uh, Google Assistant and the the equivalent uh, Windows Assistant and we have uh, the product from Amazon that you talk with and they do a pretty good job of listening and and uh, and uh, conversing with you so this uh, cartoon that we're looking at where we where we misunderstand each other I mean we do get some funny misunderstandings but um, uh, they do pretty well and people seem to be uh, fairly confident in using them um, the most popular use for speech interface interfaces is currently for call routing although with the advent of things like uh, Siri and those devices I talked about um, we're using those more and more so uh, I think that's uh, certainly a competitor for the most use. 
um, uh, we can have color-led speech where the user st states their need in their own words, like I'm having problems with my voicemail. Uh, the idea is that they would automatically be forwarded to the appropriate uh, service or person. And they're asking us to talk about our own experience. <clears throat> we have, we talk about these things a lot in our house because uh, my wife is a project manager for a travel management uh, company. And so they have a lot of speech applications that um, they use to uh, moderate the interaction between their travel agents and their uh, customers. And they have really invested a lot of money and time into making them uh, high quality. And so uh, whenever we're calling uh, somebody else, uh, she's explaining how they have either done a great job or a poor job, or they spent a lot or didn't spend enough on their uh, speech applications. So we have a lot of fun with that here at uh, Casa Trainer. Uh, the format of the experiences it can be different. You can have directed uh, dialogues uh, where the system is in control of the conversation. So they ask specific questions and they require specific responses. Uh, more flexible systems allow the user to take the I I initiative. For instance, I'd like to go to Paris next Monday for two weeks. Uh, there's more chance of an error uh, because once you begin you know, to talk, uh, as soon as the user begins to think of the system as a human, then they might outstrip the capability. Uh, guided prompts can help get the callers back on track. Uh, sorry, I did not get all that. Did you say that you wanted to fly next Monday? Okay, and uh, the fancier systems are just up to this level right now. I just think that our major complaint is how to get out of the uh, dialogue. So uh, typically, you can just say operator, and they'll give you to an agent. Say either operator or agent, and they'll say, oh, I think I heard you said that you wanted to talk to an agent. Would you like to talk to an agent? Uh, because there's a lot of times when you get uh, forwarded these things and you don't want to be there. And uh, that's when you're, t when, when you're tempted to curse at them. At least I am. It's always funny to curse at this kind of technology. Now that's, that's uh, probably reflects on my character in a bad way, but it's, it's still sometimes fun. Uh, how do uh, research and design issues for s speech? Uh, how to design a system that can keep the conversations on track? Uh, so we want to help people navigate efficiently through a menu system. Um, you know these things where they have you, uh, if they give you a list of things, and then you have to choose. You know press or say one, press or say two. Well, we get back to some of the cognitive things. You can only like, keep some of these things in your mind at the same time. So these, uh, these, um, these conversations that are more uh, tree-like, where they say, do you want to, do you want to do this or that? Uh, this. Then do you want to do this a subpart or that subpart? Those help a lot. The ones where you have to remember a list are pretty, uh, pretty bad indeed. Um, they have, uh, instead of using a computer generated speech, they uh, have used uh, voice actors um, that record the full, uh, the full uh, vocabulary. Um, in the case of using these things uh, commercially, like for, for uh, clients and stuff, 
they will even uh, record uh, the properly pronounced client uh, name, particularly if you have a client that doesn't have a, um, an easily computer pronounced name. You want to make sure that you're calling the name of their uh, company the right thing or the name of their university the right thing. Uh, and so typically, uh, one of the ups and extras is to record a bunch of uh, names and words that are pretty specific to your client base and uh, your application. And you usually can, um, you know, you can pick the actor. I mean, there are companies that just have voice actors for just this thing. There are whole companies that... What do they do? They provide the talent for this kind of work. Okay, what's next? Well, pens are next. I'm going to have to confess that I'm not a pen fan. Okay, but uh, many are. These will enable people to write, draw, select, and move objects at an interface using light pens or styluses. Or would that be style eye? I'm not sure. Uh, we capitalize on the well-honed drawing skills developed from childhood. Uh, digital pens like Anoto use a combination of ordinary ink pen with a digital camera that digitally records everything written with the pen on special paper, kind of geographic paper. That's a cool app. Pros and cons. It allows users to quickly and easily annotate existing documents. It can be difficult to see options on the screen because user's hand can include part of it when writing. That's my major complaint about all of the credit card things that you have to sign. Uh, there's usually not a good place to rest your hand. And if you rest your hand on the screen, it uh, goes uh, bad. Uh, they can have lag or they can feel kind of clunky. So um, generally this uh, pen stuff, we used to have these light pens that we'd, we would use to uh, select text. I and mean, this is back when we were using uh, green screen uh, terminals. And people have always been kind of interested in, in pen interfaces. Um, uh, currently, uh, for teaching, they have these things, they have these kind of tablets where you can draw. And I, I bought a couple of those. I've been through, I think, two of those that I, I decided I didn't like. And it, it's better to talk without the drawing. They just seemed to kind of clunky themselves. So I personally have been disappointed by pens, including the pens that we signed on the credit card machines with. Um, your mileage may vary. <clears throat> okay, how about the touch interface? Well, we're using a lot of this more and more. So touch screens such as walk-up kiosks detect the presence and location of a person's touch on the display. Multi-touch um, can support a range of dynamic fingertip actions. Swiping, flicking, we've got that pinching where you pull your your uh, fingers uh, together or reverse uh, pinching where you're pulling things apart, uh, pushing and tapping. So there are all kinds of things that you can do. Um, some of the touch uh, displays, uh, some of the newer Apple ones they've been talking about, I, I don't have one that does this, uh, can tell the difference between uh, touching and pushing, um, which uh, can have a different meaning. And so there's a, there's a whole other level of interaction that's uh, possible there. Uh, it's now used for many kinds of displays, such as smartphones, iPods, tablets, and tabletops. One one of the nice things is you uh, you seem to be able to create a kiosk kind of uh, I interactivity with just uh, just a tablet like an iPad. Uh, I'm always impressed when I go into an Apple store and they've got a bunch of these iPads uh, connected up on their little uh, cables so they don't walk out the door. 
but they typically have uh, some kind of app running on them that's either a, a demonstration or some kind of interactive thing. And uh, pretty much the same kind of things that you could have put onto a more dedicated uh, kiosk in times past, um, you can get just uh, right out of a tablet. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. Research and design issues for touch. Um, more fluid and direct styles of interaction involving freehand and pen-based uh, gestures. Again, uh, pens, boo, I'm not a pen guy. Freehand stuff, I think it's very promising. Um, I uh, certainly, I've I I interacted with uh, devices that... Um, uh, can sense uh, freehand uh, gestures. I just haven't learned them, and I, I think that learning them is going to be uh, kind of the challenge. Uh, core design concerns include whether size, orientation, and shape of the touch it display affects uh, things like uh, collaboration. Uh, it's much faster to scroll through wheels, carousels, and bars of thumbnail I I images. Uh, or it, it, uh, how do you compare that to uh, finger flicking? I mean, there are times when finger flicking just wears you out. Uh, so there are some opportunities uh, for us as uh, interaction design practitioners to create enough, to use enough interaction I I I idioms to to give some choice for scrolling kinds of opportunities depending upon um, how fine of a scroll or how gross of a scroll we want to do. Uh, there's more cumbersome and uh, they're more cumbersome and error prone and slower to type using a virtual keyboard on a touch display than using a physical keyboard. Um, uh, that's kind of interesting. The fact is that uh, that was a big uh, complaint for me when I was uh, a new user of a virtual keyboard. Uh, it's less of a complaint now. Some of that auto-completion uh, technology that, uh, that Apple has built into the iOS apps, and I'm sure that the other vendors have too, um, it gives you a payback for having a soft uh, keyboard. If I can type just the first letter or two of the word and it can suggest the rest of the word, then that can make up for a lot of the speed loss that I get from not being able to use uh, touch typing. Um, here we're talking about some new ways that we might be able to I interact. Uh, here's a typing uh, 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 a typing approach where uh, if you look at the, the screen here, it's that we we don't have to pick up our finger and put it back down. Just uh, pausing and changing a direction is enough uh, to tell uh, the device which key we want to push. And potentially, we could save a lot of energy by not having to tap quite so much. It's not something that I've used, but um, it's called the swipe interface. And I, I think it's a cool idea. Um, I'm always a little worried on these. Some of these I take too easily, and some of these I don't. And probably, you're going to be at the mercy of the sensibilities of your user. But... Having these as possibilities, I think, uh, is a great thing. Uh, next, we're going to talk about air-based gestures, and I mentioned them a little bit before. Um, uh, classically, they use uh, uh, camera recognition, sensor, and computer vision techniques to try to decipher what gestures you are making with your body, your arms, and your hands. Um, one of the systems that does this is called Connect. Uh, movements are mapped onto a variety of gaming motions such as swinging, bowling, hitting, and punching. 
uh, that the players are represented on the screen as avatars doing the same actions. Uh, it's not all games, though. Um, one of the things that you can do that we're showing here with the picture is, for instance, have a gestural interface for, say, surgeons to navigate their way through information systems uh, without having to touch uh, keyboards or mice or other physical devices and break uh, sterility. Uh, here we have a picture um, that's kind of getting into one of our uh, one of our next uh, subjects because this here's uh, here's a system that uh, through kind of wearable technology here is able to uh, detect the the violin playing that's going on and also through some haptic feedback to give some coaching. Research and design issues here. Um, how does a computer recognize and delineate users' gestures? Um, so there are some positional things. There are some moving gesture things. There, there's, there's all kinds of possibilities. Um, thing is, is for us to uh, settle on a. Uh, a, a dialect or dialects that are going to be effective. Does holding a control device feel more intuitive than controller free gestures? Well, uh, for gaming, I think it maybe does. I know uh, playing the Wii and you're supposed to be playing golf, having a little control device to swing um, uh, is pretty helpful. Uh, although I found that when we were doing bowling, um, it just seemed kind of odd the way we were doing it, but it seemed to work. So for those uh, gamey things, uh, having a controller seemed fine. But uh, certainly if I were a surgeon and trying to navigate an information system or control some kind of medical device, uh, I don't want to touch anything. So I would like to do uh, some kind of free air hand gestures. Um, we touched on this a minute ago, these, these haptic or tactile feedback uh, systems. We saw the picture of the uh, violinist uh, who was in kind of in a harness and uh, part of that system is to give haptic feedback to the violinist to change their posture and things like that. So you get uh, uh, feelings of touch, either uh, either being uh, squeezed or uh, maybe a buzz or some kind of pressure. Um, you can enrich a user experience or nudge them to correct their error. Uh, it can also be used to simulate a sense of touch between remote uh, people who want to communicate. And uh, somewhere in the text is a discussion I think a couple of uh, chapters ago of some kind of a, you know, a hug jacket or a hug blanket or uh, something like that for maybe uh, grandparents and grandkids. So as a soon-to-be grandfather, somehow I think that might be a good idea. Although my, uh, my grandchild will probably only be 10 minutes away, so probably easier to get in, in the car than to uh, pull out the device. Uh, here's our violinist again, so they're getting uh, real-time vibrotactile feedback. It provides nudges when playing incorrectly. It uses motion capture, and the nudges are vibrations on the arms and hands. Okay. Probably better than having some old man with a stick uh, keep hitting you and saying, Kevin, Kevin, that's wrong, that's wrong. Um although that's quite a circuit board she has on her back there. Perhaps this is the prototype. 
<clears throat> uh, research and design issues having to do with uh, haptic interfaces. Where best to place the actuators on the body? Whether to use a single touch or a single a sequence of touches? When to buzz and how intense? My uh, smartwatch uh, buzzes reasonably often. Uh, one of the applications uh, tells me that I have to move. Another one of the applications that I have interacts with my smartphone and it gives me news alerts that are coming in on the smartphone. So every time the president signs a new executive order, my wrist buzzes. Uh, and I've not decided whether that's good or, or bad, but at least I have the potential to be alerted uh, before the end of the world. Um, how does the wearer feel it in different contexts? What kind of new smartphone, smartwatch apps can you use vibrotactile creatively? Uh, so slow tapping to feel like water dropping that is meant to indicate that it's about to rain. Heavy tapping to indicate that a thunderstorm is looming. Now these are the things we're just going to discover and somebody's going to come up with a formula that works and put it in a product and we're all going to be trying to copy it. <clears throat> what about multimodal interfaces? Well they're meant to provide an enriched and, co enriched and complex user experiences. Uh, multiplying how information is experienced and detected using different modalities, touch, sight, speech, and sound. So this is, this is going to cross over into a lot of the interfaces that we talked about before. It's, it's just a combination of them. Um, potentially we could support more flexible, efficient, and expressive means of human computer interaction. Uh, most commonly is speech and vision. Okay, now um, probably the multimodal device that I use the most often is my uh, uh, GPS when I'm in my car. So uh, I'm looking at the display that's uh, visual and then it, it talks to me. So that's uh, audio and uh, I like to have the audio cues because then I, I know that there are times when I need to look over and see the map as it's coming up and changing. Uh, and there are other times when I can just uh, wait for the next audio uh, cue. So the, the combination of those modes um, create a pretty rich experience. Research and design issues for multimodal. Uh, the need to recognize and analyze speech, gesture, and eye gaze. So all, all of the the um, all of the challenges that we had with these individually, plus the issues of how how to do this in a combined way. Well, okay, so it's just that much more complex. Uh, what's gained from com combining different input and outputs? Is talking and gesturing as human do with other humans a natural way of interacting with a computer? And this is something that comes up, I think, in a couple places in the chapter and in the course and text, which is, um, there's always this uh, kind of assumption that we have that we'd like to interact with uh, systems the way that we interact with other humans. And yet, when you really think about it, other humans are pretty frustrating to interact with, sometimes uh, compared to the uh, devices that we um, are able to interact with. So things that mimic the way that we would interact with another human might be better or might be worse. Um, and um, certainly a lot of research opportunities there. 
Uh, in an earlier chapter, we talked about these uh, shareable technologies that create common experiences. Okay, so uh, shareable interfaces are designed for more than one person to use. We provide uh, multiple inputs and sometimes allow simultaneous input by co-located groups. Uh, we might have large wall displays where people use their own pens or gestures. We, we might have interactive tabletops, and we've seen some pictures of those, and we've got a couple coming up, where small groups I interact with I information using their fingertips. Uh, again, uh, probably my, my experience is watching this go on on uh, television. Uh, I typically get a, ki a kick out of these uh, crime shows where they're, they're uh, trying to sift through some data. This is always big on uh, Hawaii Five-0, which I wasn't a fan of until uh, it was recommended by my uh, mother-in-law. And now we, we watch it all the time. And uh, they love their... Um, they love their uh, table where they all get at the table and different people sort of I interact with the data. And um, typically they only interact with it one at a time. But, um, you know, you get, you, get, you get an idea about how your work life uh, might be different in, with uh, some of these uh, digitally engineered common experiences. So um, uh, products that they talk about in the text, uh, Diamond Touch, Smart Table, and Surface. Uh, so uh, smart boards are interesting. Uh, people have been putting them in the classrooms that I've been teaching in for about maybe 15 years now. And I've been avoiding them for maybe about 15 years now. Um, so I'm not a smart board fan. Um, they're always too finicky for me. There's always, a, oh, don't do that to them or do that to them. So the best thing I can do with a smart board is, is to, uh, get them out of the way to get to the whiteboard, uh, or the projector screen. Uh, again, your mileage is going to vary. Uh, here's the Diamond Touch tabletop. So you've got uh, two users interacting with uh, uh, graphical objects at the same time on the same tabletop. That looks cool. Advantages, uh, you can provide a large interactional space that can support flexible group working. It can be used by multiple users at the same time. So you can point to and touch information being displayed. You can simultaneously view the interactions and have the same shared point of reference as others. Um, you can support more equitable participation compared with groups using a single PC. And th this is kind of the scenario that I get on Hawaii Five O, in that. Uh, Again, these people are typically interacting with their table one at a time, but uh, people don't have to get up and down and, and change all kinds of, you know, we don't have to say, well, I'm going to drive now. Now I'm going to drive now. No, we can all drive and we can all be kind of standing around the Hawaii Five O table. Research and design issues. Well, um, Perhaps we need more fluid and direct styles of interaction involving freehand and pen-based uh, gestures. Um, we have core design concerns, including whether size, orientation, and shape of the display have an effect on uh, collaboration. Um, I've got to say that these uh, table-oriented things where people collect around them seem very appealing to me. They seem very group centric uh, boards that people uh, c uh, collect in front of maybe less so but still they have a lot of uh, possibilities um, 
providing larger size tabletops does not improve group working, but encourages more division of labor. So there are a lot of uh, design and research opportunities uh, going on here. And again, to, you know, we're, we're trying to invent new ways of uh, working and uh, we will. So what, what is on Hawaii Five-0 today um, is going to be in our uh, conference room tomorrow. And probably better than the Hawaii Five-0 version by far. <clears throat> okay, what about tangible interfaces? Well, what do we mean? Well, it's a type of sensor-based interaction where physical objects uh, something like, say, bricks are coupled with digital representation. So there's a physical object that we're going to manipulate and that we're going to sense that in our information system. So when a person manipulates the physical object, it causes a digital effect to occur, like an animation. Digital effects can take place in a number of media and places or can be embedded in the physical object. Uh, so there are three uh, products that they uh, discuss in the text. Chromarium cubes, flow blocks, and ERP. So chromarium cubes, uh, when turned over, it, digital animations of color are mixed on an adjacent wall. It uh, facilitates creativity and collaborative exploration. I've not used them, but I've always wanted to. Um, I've never, I've never had access to them. Uh, Flowbox, it, it, it depic depicting changing numbers and lights embedded in the blocks, depending uh, they vary depending on how they're connected together. Uh, again, I find this very appealing, although I've not really done anything with it uh, hands-on. And ERP, uh, physical models of buildings moved around on a tabletop, used in combination with tokens for wind and shadows um, to do some kind of uh, structural wind modeling. So what are some of the benefits of those uh, kind of tangible apps in the interface uh, world? Um, can be held in both hands and uh, combined and manipulated in ways not possible using other interfaces. It allows for more than one person to explore the interface together. Objects can be placed on top of each other, beside each other, inside each other. Encourages, encourages different ways of representing and exploring a problem space. And I've just got to say that in science fiction, when they discover these kind of objects, it, it, you know, they always have, in good science fiction, they always have this kind of uh, tangible computing interface uh, quality. So uh, if it's good science fiction, perhaps it's good science. Um, the, I can think of, I'm thinking back to uh, two or three uh, uh, science fiction uh, stories where I, saw, I was like, I wish we had that device, you know. Uh, people are able to see and understand situations differently. They can lead to greater insight, learning, and problem solving you know, with other kinds of interfaces. So they're, they're very discovery oriented and they can facilitate creativity and reflection. So this, this whole area is very exciting to me. Haven't really gotten a lot of opportunity to do it myself. Very high on my list for stuff that I want to play with. Uh, here's, here's an example of Voxbox. Um, I hope these things are more appealing than they appear because they... Um, the description of these in the text is much more engaging than what they look like, which is uh, you know what they look like? They look like activities that I would buy in a 
we have a store in our town that sells materials to teachers. So you can go buy posters to put up on the wall, activity books, flashcards, you know, manipulating things, uh, things that count. It looks like uh, something that you would buy at, at that store, which I think would be cool, but um, only if you're dealing with children. So this is a tangible system that gathers opinions at events through playful and engaging interaction. Um, again, I'm hoping that we are tangibilizing and engaging with uh, younger folks uh, here because it just hasn't got that science fiction cool that I would like it to have. Research and design issues for tangible um, we need to develop new conceptual frameworks that identify novel and specific features. Um, we need to discover the right kind of coupling action to use between the physical action and the digital, and the digital effect, because uh, typically we're, we're using the physical component as an input device, or perhaps an output device. We can really use it for both. Uh, but there's there's some uh, there's some uh, digital experience that's going on at the same time that we need to track. So really, have two things going on. Um, if it's to support learning, then an explicit mapping between the action and the effect is critical. If it's for entertainment, then it can be better designed to be more implicit or unexpected. Uh, because we're the little bit of uh, serendipity can be um, can be fun. On the other hand, if we're learning how to take out somebody's appendix and we cut off their left arm, well, perhaps that's not fun at all. What kind of physical artifact to use? So uh, some of the ones we've talked about, bricks, cubes, and other component sets are most commonly used because of flexibility and simplicity. You know, we're looking for general objects uh, a lot of times that you can combine into, into assemblies. Uh, stickies and cardboard tokens can also be used for placing material onto a surface. Um, yes, but is it as cool? That's what I would say. Uh, we've worked our way up to augmented and mixed reality. So augmented reality, virtual representations are superimposed on physical devices or objects. Uh, mixed reality, views of the real world are combined with views of a virtual environment. We have many applications including medicine, games, flying, and everyday exploring. And uh, two that they talk about in the text that I find very promising are one where we take uh, sort of like x-ray-ish diagnostic information and project it, say, right onto the patient. So um, say a surgeon could say, oh, okay, we're cutting right here, okay, right here next to the belly button, right by that mole, okay. And uh, some other things where they might uh, take a diagnostic application for an engine and then be able to uh, be able to indicate on that engine uh, how locate the part that has got to be fixed. It's just like oh, oh we're taking off that part, okay? Or and if uh, the resolution is high enough, yes, we're going to. You know, we're going to loosen these two uh, nuts, uh, this one and this one, which we're pointing out with uh, some kind of a laser pointer. Uh, so the examples, which I forgot was on this slide, we talked about the, uh, the medicine one, um, being able to project the x-ray or scan right on the body. In air traffic control, which I didn't talk about, dynamic information about aircraft overlaid on a video screen showing the real planes landing, taking off, and taxiing helps identify planes that are difficult to make out. 
And of course, uh, this is really, these are two high stakes areas of medicine and air traffic uh, control. So these are places where we're trying to squeeze out errors more and more and bringing these kinds of technologies has the promise of uh, reducing errors even further, which uh, has a real value to the uh, society. Here's an augmented map where we are, uh, say, taking a map and then we're projecting uh, data on top of it in order to uh, make the mapping a more interactive experience. Um, <clears throat> here's an interesting uh, kind of uh, kind of application where we're we're taking a 3D character to act as a personal tour guide at a science museum. Uh, Top Gear being a show, and James May being, I think, a British TV personality. Uh, and here's an example of an odd augmented reality application. Uh, perhaps more interesting to the Brits than us here in the US. What are some of the research and design issues in augmented reality? Uh, well, what kind of digital augmentation are we going to use? Uh, uh, where are we going to use it in the physical environment and when? Uh, it needs to stand out, but not to distract from an ongoing task. So, for instance, if we are going to uh, uh, point out parts to the auto mechanic, uh, that's great. But, of course, we don't want to blind them with the laser uh, when they go to take the part off. So, there's, there's, uh, there's some real how intrusive to make it um, kind of issues. And then we need to be able to align with real world objects. So if, if we want to be able to point to the exact place on the engine or so exact of, you know, this is the head of the bolt that you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to loosen, then you're going to need uh, quite a bit of resolution and uh, pretty sophisticated object finding in your application. I'm sorry. I thought I paused that, and I don't think I did. Well, I'm going to have to go try to edit that out. If you heard me cough, gosh, I'm so sorry. It's getting pretty late at night here. So it looks like we're moving along. We're going to continue recording. So um, research and design issues. Uh, what kind of digital augmentation? Uh, and what kind of device? So. Uh, are we going to have a specialized device, are we, or are we going to we're going to adapt a smartphone, a heads-up display? Are we going to do some kind of other thing? I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities here. Um, come on back, right here. Let's talk about wearables. Um, the first uh, developments uh, in this area were headwear and eyewear uh, mounted cameras that enabled the user to record what was seen and access to digital information. Uh, since we've, we, we've expanded the line, we have uh, jewelry, head mounted caps, smart fabrics, glasses, shoes, and jackets have all been used. Um, and we've got really both sides of the interaction. So we've got uh, we've got some sensing, okay, or recording, and then we have some some ways of giving giving output 
uh, to uh, the user. So we have both input and output aspects of this. So applications include automatic diaries, tour guides, cycle indicators, and fashion clothing. Um, Google Glass uh, was, was a really popular thing. It didn't last that long. It was pretty short-lived. But uh, Google Glass allowed you to uh, record um, your life as you experience it and also to display uh, some uh, computer-based information. The pros and cons, uh, one, um, it was cool. I mean, that was uh, the pro uh, cool if you were able to master it. Um, uh, cons, um, perhaps uh, safety issues if you were distracted by it. Um, uh, politeness issues if those around you were distracted by it. And maybe privacy issues if you were recording things that other people thought uh, it were better left um, unrecorded. So research and design issues for these wearables. Well, we've got comfort. So they need to be light and small, not get in the way. They need to be fashionable, preferably hidden in the clothing. Uh, we get back to the crime and spy shows, right? Uh, hygiene, is it possible to wash or clean the clothing once worn? You know, can we share these things? Can we share a pair, a pair of Google Glass uh, uh, glasses? Well, maybe, maybe not. Ease of wear, uh, how easy is it to remove the gadgetry and replace it? Usability, how does the user control the devices that are embedded in clothing. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of possibilities here. And um, the profit motive being what it is, people are going to uh, continue to do this until they, until they hit things that we want to buy. Uh, Google Glass probably wasn't the, the product opportunity that Google had maybe hoped it might turn into. Uh, I think they saw it more as an experiment than a, than a real life uh, product, but um, um, but that's okay. That's what Google uh, likes to do. So, what exactly is going to hit in this area? I'm not sure, but I know something will. Uh, next, robots and drones. Okay. So one of the nice things about this uh, text is that uh, in uh, the third edition, we talked about robots, but uh, not drones. And uh, now a lot of things going on with drones. Now we're talking about robots and drones. And I really like that about the authors. They, they put a lot of effort into keeping their text uh, current, which is why we're already on the fourth edition. And the first one was in uh, 2000. So they don't have a long life. So there's four types of robot that we want to uh, think about. Uh, remote robots used in hazardous settings, uh, like in a melting down nuclear reactor. Uh, domestic robots helping us around the house. Uh, pet robots used as human companions. Sociable robots that work collaboratively with humans and communicate and socialize with them as if they were our peers. Uh, some advantages. Uh, pet robots are assumed to have therapeutic qualities, helping to reduce stress and loneliness. Uh, remote robots can be controlled to I investigate bombs and other uh, dangerous uh, materials. I know they've used a lot of uh, robots at the uh, uh, Fukushima nuclear uh, facility where they, they had a nuclear accident. They haven't been able to achieve everything that they wanted to with the robots, but they've they certainly um, have had good uh, safety and health advantages. 
<clears throat> so let's talk a bit about drones. Uh, drones are unmanned aircraft. Uh, sometimes uh, watercraft would also be referred to as drones that are controlled remotely and used in a number of contexts. Uh, they may be used for entertainment, such as carrying drinks and food to people at festivals and parties. Agricultural applications, such as flying them over vineyards and fields to collect uh, data that's useful to farmers. Or helping to track uh, poachers in wildlife uh, uh, parks in, in Africa. And we have a lot of things. I mean, we've had people talking about the delivering things to our homes. Uh, I recently read an article about a scheme to uh, deliver uh, transplantable human organs. Um, you know, the life of a transplantable human organ is pretty short and the ability to get it, say, from a hospital to the airport uh, quickly is uh, sometimes hard to do. They do it with uh, helicopters and stuff. Well, there are people who are thinking they can do that with uh, drones. Um, they can fly low and stream photos to a ground station where the images can be stitched together into maps. Uh, they can be used to determine the health of a crop or when it's the best time to harvest a crop. Um, so I, I think what's really interesting about drones is that, um, you know, we don't really talk about a lot of the devices that we, you know, we might want to control, but, you know, remote control uh, uh, cars and planes and boats and stuff have been around for a long time. And initially they had a pretty analog interfaces, but in these days, uh, the systems that control them are digital. And so it's pretty interesting. We get a lot of possibilities about the, um, just the types of interactions that we can do. I mean, uh, with uh, airplane drones used by the military, they typically uh, get a TV signal. So they the operator who uh, sometimes is not even on the same continent can uh, uh, can see what can be seen from the drone in the air. So there are all kinds of possibilities uh, there. I mean, you may agree that those are good or not agree and say that those are bad applications, but certainly these, these kinds of ways of interacting with drones uh, uh, have gotten uh, fairly rich in the digital era. So here's a picture of a drone in in a uh, vineyard, and the idea here is that for uh, you know for people in agriculture uh, who have a pretty big uh, vineyard or farm or whatever they have, the conditions in uh, one part of their vineyard or farm could be different than the other conditions so you, so you just can't look at the you just can't look at the grapes that are uh, uh, by the hacienda and assume that all the other ones are like that you really have to get out and expect them out and inspect them all and this is a pretty uh, inexpensive and comprehensive way to do it what are some of the research and design issues with uh, robots and drones? So uh, how do humans react to physical robots that are designed to exhibit uh, human-like behaviors like facial expressions compared with virtual ones? Okay. Um, there's always been this feeling that there's going to be a pushback with uh, uh, humanoid robots that are too lifelike. Um, I don't know that we've really established that. There's probably some, I think we talk about some uh, research in the chapter uh, briefly. But uh, those are certainly interesting questions. Um, should... Robots be designed to be 
human-like or look like and behave like robots that serve a clearly defined uh, purpose. Uh, should the interaction be designed to enable people to interact with the robots as if they were another human being or more human computer-like, like, like uh, pressing buttons or uh, uh, command line interfaces or something like that? Uh, then we have issues like, is it acceptable to use unmanned drones to take a series of images of or videos of uh, fields, towns, and private property without the consent of uh, the people who might be recorded. Well, uh, there are a lot of us who think that that uh, presents a pretty serious privacy issue. Um, how about brain-computer interfaces? This is one that we didn't have a couple of, uh, a couple of editions ago. So brain-computer interfaces provide a communication pathway between a person's brain waves and an external device such as a cursor on a screen. A person is trained to concentrate on the task, for like moving the cursor. Brain-computer interfaces work through detected, detecting changes in neural functioning in the brain. Uh, BCI apps include games and uh, potentially enabling people who are paralyzed to control robots. Um, so these things are pretty cool. Again, I, not anything I've had a chance to try myself, but certainly a lot that I've seen in, uh, on uh, TV, usually in a fictional setting. So it's always kind of interesting uh, how close these things are to the uh, reality. Uh, here we have uh, two subjects playing the brain ball game using a brain computer interface. So they're uh, trying to control uh, balls with their um, with their brains. Uh, okay, so we talked about a lot of kind of interfaces. So now you've got to think about uh, what kind of interface you want. All right. And, you know, there are times when we as the practitioner find people, you know, we find our clients already wanting a particular kind of interface and we're either reinforcing that or uh, trying to deflect them towards what we think are more promising opportunities. But when we're thinking about it in the big picture, um, all kinds of questions are going to come up. Um, would uh, multi media be better than tangible interfaces for learning um, is speech as e effective as a command-based interface is a multimodal interface more effective than a monomodal interface that's one that only has one mode Will wearable interfaces be better than mobile interfaces for helping people find information in foreign cities? I doubt it, but we're going to find out. Um, are virtual environments the ultimate interface for playing games? Well, maybe not board games. I love board games. Will shareable interfaces be better at supporting communication and collaboration compared with using network desktop uh, PCs? Well, these don't have one answer, okay? I mean, think about our point of view in this course. Our point of view is that it's going to depend upon the task at hand. It's going to depend upon um, uh, the abilities and the sensibilities of our user. Uh, it's going to probably depend upon our budget. It's going to depend upon um feasible alternatives it's, it's going to depend upon a lot of stuff but um these are all going to be interesting questions because we need to go we're going to need to balance these things off before we make our choices uh <clears throat> so uh the first uh, a bullet point here about which interface is kind of what I just said. It's going to depend on the task, the users, the context, the cost, the robustness. Uh, but it's also going to depend on trends, right? 
now we have a trend that mobile platforms are taking over from uh, from uh, PCs. It's not just a style or a fad. I mean, there there's just you know these things a trend because they because of the dynamics in the marketplace. Uh, speech interfaces are also being used much more for a, a variety of commercial services. Uh, appliance and vehicle interfaces are becoming more important. Shareable and tangible interfaces entering our home, schools, and public places and workplaces is something that we're seeing. So a combination of we've got to really understand the needs and we've got to really understand the audience. And then we've got to be in touch with uh, things as they're changing in our world and trending. Um, so the summary of the chapter I have here, and I'm never one for going through chapter summaries all too much. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pause here and just kind of summarize from my perspective. Um, the, um, uh, it, this again is a, a bit of a primer, uh, and a bit of an encyclopedia. Okay. There's enough in any one of the areas to, uh, get you started and get you oriented, um, get you thinking about things you haven't thought about in a while. The text has a lot of references to research to other resources that will uh, get you going to uh, greater depth on any of these uh, and i hope you enjoyed it so i'm going to say bye until next time bye bye